somewhere between the Semperian knot and the Regilian Aranso. Um, now, Bernard Cash is, well, if, if the number of times you see his book carried around the school is any guide to its being read, which of course is always a question, uh, he must be the most read author we've had in the school for some time. Um, Bernard Cash uh, is, is going to talk, I think, about his workshop, uh, Objectile, um, and he's also an expert uh, on digital television, having conducted strategic studies for Philips, Canal Plus, and, and France Telecom. And he's written kind of articles on communication, economics, and policy. Uh, he's also kind of probably better known to you um, as a philosopher and architectural theoretician uh, who wrote the book that you've been carrying around, Earth Moves, uh, a, a text written, obviously, in sort of close proximity to the late Gilles Deleuze. Um, it's a very great pleasure to welcome him here this evening to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't know my book was so popular here. Could we turn off the light? Thank you. <coughs> okay. So, uh, thank you for being here and um, my lecture today will be divided in two parts. The first one, very practical, and the second one, theoretical, but both of which being in close relation with the activity of Objectil, the small company I founded with my three partners, Patrick Bosset, Taufik Hammoudi, and Jean-Louis Jameau. What we do in Objectil is trying to implement all the means of conception and the manufacturing facilities needed to produce objects which always differ, although belonging to the same series. Objectile means non-standard conception and production. It is a kind of continuation of the machinic philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. Let's say, that what we are trying to, that we are trying to incarnate the concepts of difference and repetition into objects which no longer have a definite identity as a graspable form to copy, but constitute singularities, the repetition of which is a consequence of their continuously differing. As a private research lab, we are very pragmatic. Non-standard conception means that our objects are no more drawn but calculated. Basically, we use functions where parameters can vary in such a way that once we've written a set of functions, we do not have a single form but an infinite variety of shapes. In itself, that is not new. One could say, for instance, that Renaissance architecture was but a combination of straight lines and arcs of circle, which are both easy functions to calculate and combine according to the rules of, pro of proportions. The compass and the square were already computers. Or put in other words, let's, let us say that computers are nothing more than distorted compass enabling us to calculate the inflections of variable curvatures, which in the end changes many things. And especially when it comes to manufacturing, parametric forms stop being a scholarly video game 
as soon as you implement the adequate means of production, which enable you to automatically generate machining programs. When Objectile started its development, uh, that was 10 years ago, we were using some of the best CAD CAM software available at those time. I'm speaking of Euclid or Katia. And I remember that it took us some 30 hours to generate the machining program of a free surface uh, that is nearly as much as the time it would have taken if you would have sanded it by hands. Non-standard object remain sheer virtuality as long as you are not only able to generate the machining program in a minute, but also calculate the estimated time and cost of production and transmit all that through a network down to the factory with all the peripheral information needed by the workers to correctly position the pieces on the CNC machine and have the same reference in their workshop than those you have in your office in front of your computer. And in the end, you would like the result to be beautiful. So to do that, Objectile is not alone, but we are backed by TopCAD, a not so small French software company in the field of mechanics, with whom we make our, propriet our proprietary developments day after day. We had to get involved into computer program writing because available software are mainly made for the biggest CAD CAM markets, which are by far mechanics and aerodynamics. The problems there are very different from the free forms that architects may be willing to design. And that is the reason why we think that nowadays architecture creation starts at the level of software writing, just as Gottfried Zemper recommended to start architecture at the level of the technical arts, which for him generated the Ur motif, the primitive patterns, to be used by the, monu the, the monumental art. There is nowadays an electronic art upstream from the other technical arts. So let's have a look at all that. On this first slide, you can see surfaces generated by calculus and visualized as geographical maps. As everything conceived by Objectile, these surfaces can be deformed and animated in various modes. But these fixed images gives us enough to think about already. What struck us is the fact that very quickly we fell upon images coming from all kinds of pictorial traditions, be it modern painting like Mondrian, well, this one is easy, or more contemporary like uh, Alechinsky. So I can assure you that uh, uh, this picture was not drawn with paintbrush, uh, but that every pixel on this image obeys to a mathematical function. Or we can generate uh, African patterns and uh, Chinese calligraphic signs, which I will show you afterwards. This is more a, a cyber type image. So thanks to Joseph Fourier and his well-known Fourier transform, which is now built into FFT integrated circuits, you, you have one in your digital television, uh, we can consider very seriously the affirmation of Leibniz that there is no form, however complicated it be, which cannot be calculated. Computer are, ju are just starting to accomplish Leibniz's program. And this is the reason why we stick to the mathematical level in computer form generation. So these are examples of surfaces, uh, what in fact we call subjective. And these surfaces 
can create solid when they loop on themselves and uh, we then call them objectile. So this is a, a very old picture. It's a kind of antiquity in uh, computer history. It has 10 years ago, so it's uh, maybe like uh, before Christ. Uh, so we can get all kind of volumes uh, with our calculation, uh, but we prefer to focus on those which can be manufactured within our old Euclidean space, knowing that it doesn't prevent us to explore non-spherical topologies, like, for instance, uh, well, I'll show you. So all, all these were calculated and manufactured by CNC machine, and this is uh, a toric uh, topology. Uh, as you might know, I'm a great advocate of Euclid. I think uh, there is a big uh, demagogy nowadays saying that uh, the virtual uh, and cyberspace will destroy Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, I think we should stick to Euclid and see all the consequences that the computer uh, brings to Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, when you start using computers, Euclidean geometry appears to be richer uh, than you would have think of before. So, uh, in fact, this sculpture was designed to debug our machining program generator. We decided to concentrate adulate, undulating texture on the saddle point where you get an inverted double curvature. Just to give you an idea of the type of problems which force us to adopt very specific strategies, you must know that usually mechanical software orient the machining tool according to the normal at the current point on the surface. But when it comes to undulating texture, this normal oscillates and the tool that would be oriented according to it would never stop going backward and forward. So now, you must imagine that such a tool is driven by a motor which has a certain volume and weight 100 kilos. Thus, apart from the collision problems which would not fail to occur in such a saddle point, there would be inertia problems which would force us to slow down the speed of the machine. And this is the reason why we had to invent a new method of tool orientation. Now, in passing, you will have noticed that an undulation is a succession of inflections and that a saddle point is also a well-known type of singularity. Philosophy can indeed be me me machinic. Together with other sculptures, the torus was intended to test our research and development on machining program generators. Since then, we are now focusing on industrial products, which means downgrading the system and cost cutting. Our first big contract came from the French National Railway Company. Uh, so this is still a part of the sculpture. This is a kind of geographical singularity. And here is uh, the uh, counter desk that the French National Railway asked us to finalize and manufacture. Uh, it's a cu curved counter desk which can be adapted to every single situation, knowing that it varies a lot in the thousands of stations we have in France. So to explain you this object, the dark straight line uh, you can see in the middle is where the glass separating the customer from the agent passes. The rectangular hall is a coin dish where you put your money to get your ticket. And the uh, 2,000 little holes uh, which are spre spread out covers zones where there are speakers which allow acoustic communication 
between the customer and the agent. And beside all these elements, uh, you will find all kind of electronic devices uh, which are built into the counter desk, like the microphone or acoustic interfaces. And we have now installed five regional stations and the project is about to become a national piece of equipment. Uh, but beside other industrial projects with the automobile and the plastic industry, uh, we keep on working on furniture, which is a good scale to test our technology. So I'll show you several of our furnitures. This is the cover of uh, Earth News. So you, you recognize the geographical inspiration. And uh, this is one of our latest products. Uh, it's a series of coffee table, uh, which give us the occasion to apply the concept of non-standard production to a very French traditional object. Uh, my partner, Patrick Bosset, studied fine arts with Claude Viala, one of the members of the group Support Surface, who dedicated himself to explore the variation of a single motif in all his painting, which he liked to consider as objects. Likewise, we settled the process to generate and manufacture an infinite variety of boards. We now have an exhibition project where these patterns object would be presented as well as water lilies spread out on a wall and coffee table boards on top of a traditional cast iron leg. People could then buy these boards which by their dimensions are easy to carry back home under the arm and decide to use them either as a, as a table or as a painting. Table and tableau being two French words which come from the same Latin origin, tabula, common etymology on which Zemper insisted very much. And beside these industrial design and furniture projects, we also work on much larger scales, from urban design to landscape. As a first operation at this scale, we already received land surveys from the Filipinos through the internet. We then process the information on, uh, on our computer in Paris, where we generate machining programs for wooden models. We download those, pro those programs to a factory near the Belgian border and have the models manufactured there and have them shipped to the, shipped to the Filipinos. Uh, this was in fact just a, a technical training operation uh, for which the free form of the territory is not at all a problem, but where elements like the footprints of roads can be rather tricky. Uh, having solved now these technical problems, we are now ready not only to reproduce existing landscapes, but to modulate them and finally have the earth move, since we are now, now able to produce all the information needed, not only to manufacture model, but actually build undulating landscapes. So I'll show you a couple of abstract landscape. And when it comes to urban design, we must confess that we are deeply attached to the old urban block typology. Not by chance uh, do we use the same type of functions to generate the pattern surface of uh, the wooden panel exhibited in Trans Architecture in New York, uh, which I can 
show you so that is uh, so we, we, we use the same type of functions to generate the pattern surface of this panel and to generate a urban block typology we are there hinting at the Zemperian notion of textile your motive, which we apply to the monumental art of urban fabric. Zemper advising in Wissenschaft, Industrie und Kunst to study the primitive patterns, not to reproduce them identically, but to have them change as a variation on a musical theme. theme. Now, uh, if you look at uh, these drawings, uh, you will notice that they respect a certain urban order, if only by the fact that they all have the same courtyard structure. But if you focus on each single block, you will find all kinds of events, the courtyard closing or opening onto the street, being partly or totally divided, two blocks being suddenly linked together, or an element appearing within the courtyard. All that was designed according to mathematical functions that Alan Turing invented to simulate patterns of animal skins, like for instance of the zebra. And here are images of uh, Turing functions uh, generated by computers. So, uh, finally, after the surface of landscapes and the skins of an animals, let's consider the cladding of buildings. We decided to develop a wide range of technologies to design and manufacture decorative panels. We believe that digital technologies will give a new value to Zemper's cladding principle by enabling us to design undulating surfaces. We also believe that electronic architecture shouldn't be restricted to extraordinary projects like this house we designed with Mark Bultorp. No doubt, we now have the technology to design and build dancing skyscrapers, or uh, not structured. But we keep on thinking that architecture is in itself the art of framing and that frames are basically orthogonal. So I'll just, just show you this picture to see that we can do as well as uh, the Americans in Hollywood. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, we expect most people to keep on living on horizontal floors between vertical walls well, at least for a while. Then, what has to be thought is the relation between the frame and the curvature, or put in Zimperian words, we have to articulate the cladding principle to the structure principle. In most houses, the cladding has to fit closely to the architecture. Hence, our attention to flat panels, where there is already a lot to experiment. Following Zemper, we think that architecture starts at the level of furniture and building components as simple as those panels which can be used as partitions, ceiling slabs, acoustical panels, doors, or even boards for furniture. So i show you a, a couple of these panels. Uh, this textured panel is to be used by Christian Posen Park for the new LVMH headquarters in New York. As, as you can see, we always work on multiplicity. Every single pattern can be different. And at the second level, we create multiplicity of multiplicities. For instance, uh, these three panels 
come from the same mathematical function and were designed for pupils' cupboards uh, in a school where each child could have a, a different pattern, although they belong to the same typology. Uh, the same could be imaging, for instance, for a series of doors in office corridors. Uh, those who are trained into Chinese calligraphy uh, would recognize that uh, the slide is, put, uh, is inverted uh, left and right. Uh, so I apologize for, for, for this, but uh, the first sign in Chinese calligraphy uh, if you do it with uh, the cursive way, uh, is very near to, to this sign. And in fact, we very often come to experiment calligraphy as the art of how the line can play with the structural grid to become free curvature. Uh, we sometimes connect with old calligraphic tra traditions, be it Chinese, or Arabic to push them further. Uh, if there are Arabic peop uh, speaking people here, uh, you would recognize Objectile. Uh, so it's a national program of Objectile on uh, an undulating landscape. Uh, that's more often we work on non signifying abstract calligraphy. So this is more European. And this is uh, uh, the model we use to generate uh, the holes within the limb house that we designed with Mark Bultorp. So each of the holes is different. These are other types of uh, abstract calligraphy. So, and this panel is a good example to show you how we invent design by working on the machining program generators. We first conceive this panel as a network of three horizontal lines of fully perforated holes. So that's the initial design. Then we generated the machining programs and when we looked at the trajectory of the tool on our computer screen, we noticed that the jumps between the holes, that means the red lines between the yellow line of the holes, uh, so we noticed that these jumps uh, gave the initial network a calligraphic quality. Note that those lines are generated by an algorithm which has to find a way of passing by every hole without missing any nor coming back to any already machined. Now, when it comes to find the shortest way of doing that, we fall upon a famous mathematical problem which has no calculable, calculable solution. Hence, the pragmatic decision of going from one hole to the nearest and not being an optimum, this strategy obliged to sudden long distance changes of directions which are not far away from the trajectories of our contemporary lives. So you, you can see big uh, stroke uh, from time to time. Thus, we were very interested in keeping the track of these arbitrary lines, especially uh, when it comes to the relation to the frame of the wall paneling. We then decided to let the tool stay within the matter during these germs. And to give it even more calli calligraphic quality, we wanted this track to have a variable thickness and even interrupt from time to time. So our second partner, Jean-Louis Jameau, invented algorithm to pilot the tool during the germs. So now I will show you an image of the initial machining program. And now that's the final machining programs uh, who was used to generate the panels which you see before. Now, if you take this panel as a cladding above an absorptive acoustical material, 
the insertion of non-fully perforated strokes has the effect of improving the acoustical performance of the panel by enlarging its spectrum of absorption. But it still remains that according to acoustical studies, the proportion of the surface of fully perforated holes related to the, to the total surface of the panel reaches an optimum around 17%. This is why we developed a program which enable to modify the length of the lines of the initial network in order to reach this optimum. The same program indicates and corrects the design where the spacing between the holes gets down below a critical threshold of fra fragility and corrects it, all that respecting the initial design. I explain you that because this meshing program appears as a good example of digital weaving. Uh, by weaving, I, I'm clearly alluding to uh, Zemper. <coughs> so, variable spacing in the interval of the grid is one of our greatest concerns. Our concept of crazy frame comes directly from the idea of the British mathematician Roger Penrose. How funny is it is that then grading the problem of reconstructing space with a few already extended elements and not only inextended points like the atoms of Lucretius, Penrose came upon this idea of quasi-periodical structure. As such, this grid is made of only two different types of lozenges which always combine in different figures. Uh, so uh, this quasi-periodicity was precisely the quality that Alois Rigel retained as a main feature of Muslim ornamentation on which Taufik Hamoudi, my third partner is in Objectile, is currently working. So we are not using uh, this uh, quasi-periodical structure uh, to reproduce Penrose ties, which in fact we don't like very much, but we use them uh, to generate non-periodical spacing structure, uh, which can be used into other programs. Uh, for instance, we can generate knots uh, like this one, uh, which is a kind of traditional uh, Muslim knot. Uh, but you can also generate more contemporary knots. And you can also do them in three dimensions. Uh, and you will thus have machine a never varying node structure which makes us pass somewhere in between the Zimperian knot and the Regalian Rinso, or between practice and theory. For you will have noticed that we have progressively moved from the cladding to the ornament, which has been qualified as a major crime in architecture. You will also have noticed that Objectil does nothing else than apply the Bauhaus principles in a digital age. Our design takes source in our present means of production. And because we stick to this modern principle, we do not reproduce modern design, or should I say modern, modern style design, but we create something else because the means of production have changed. This theoretical part of my lecture is an attempt to find a middle path between Zemper and Rigel, between modern rationalism and postmodern ornamentalism. So, what is there about ornament that deserves to be called criminal? Ever since Adolf Loos put the question so forcefully, it has never lost any of its relevance. The modernists remain eager to find a pure form, free of all ornamentation, while the postmodernists use a pretext of a return to history and an alleged popular rhetoric to serve up images of the past like pastiches of Greek temples. And it's true 
that ornamentation appears as a weak point of thought when the latter turns to architecture. Ever since the ten books of Vitruvius, architecture has forced thinkers to tackle the problem of the convergence of the three categories of values, the beautiful, the good, and the true. Let's be clear. We are not going to launch into a discussion of the nature of each of these three poles of values. Well, not immediately, because each of us remains free to settle its own definition of the beautiful, the good, and the true. Vitruvius, for instance, proposed the following three architectural principles. Firmites, solidity, utilites, utility, and venustes. On a first reading, then, Vitruvius relates the true to a question of technical efficiency, the solidity, while on the other hand, the good is reduced to a value of utility or functional adaptation, while finally, only the beautiful seem to retain its widest connotation. But the network of meanings of these three terms in the Latin text of Vitruvius is much more complicated and has been wisely analyzed by the Swiss historian Georg German in his introduction to the history of architecture theory. Georg German demonstrated that not only does the beautiful appear as a complex notion combining the relations of proportions, optical corrections which take into account the effects of perspective, respect for tradition and insertion in the site, but furthermore, Georg German has shown that these three principles are not independent one from the other. For example, the ideas of modulum and intercolumnum are related not only to the principle of solidity by the rules of definition for the section of the columns and the length of the intercolumnation, but also to the principle of beauty by means of the relation of proportion, since the same word, modulus, designated both the diameter of the columns and the elementary unit of the relations of proportion resulting in the word modulation as we know it today in music or in the theory of waves. If the beautiful, the good, and the true are complex categories, it is not only because each of them corresponds to various possible definitions which have changed in the course of time, but it is also because these three poles of values as a whole immediately raises the question of their independence and compatibility. This question of the convergence of the beautiful, the good, and the true, irrespective of the variation of the content itself <coughs> of these values, we will call it constructivist, not only to refer to the Soviet artistic movement bearing this name and for which this question was of utmost utmost importance, but because it is the key question faced by philosophy when it turns to architecture, when it is question of constructive thinking, or rather, or rather when what is at stake is what of thought is necessary for construction, or vice versa, what of construction is necessary for thought. In that sense, it may be that construction should not be restricted to the tecton tectonic act of laying a stone on a ground, presumably stable. Philosophy should broaden its idea of construction and encompass the three alternative Zimperian paradigms, ceramic, stereotomy, and textile, among which the latter intended as the art of waving loose indep independent threads in punctually tight knots seems of particular relevance in our contemporary world. If, as Georg German has shown, architectural theory appears up to the 18th century and apart from the Middle Ages, which are thinly documented, if then architecture theory 
appears as a commentary of, on the text of Vitruvius, we constantly find the question of weighing the same three principles, firmitas, utilitas, and venustas, despite considerable nuances. Furthermore, the rejection of the architectural orders and the triumph of rationalism have only reinforced the importance of the question of the possible convergence of the three categories of value. With the modernists, true will not just be a question of efficiency, but of constructing truth, which the two other values will obey. Constructive truth will be declared naturally beautiful and socially useful when it uses the modern means of production. In short, let us say that modernity still remains Vitruvian, although it writes off the five orders. What does that leave? The three principles and the postulate of their convergence under the dominance of one of them alone, the through. Just build on the solid ground of science and you will get a naturally good and beautiful house. Let us admit then that, that until the modernist, thinking about construction has always turned around the question of the convergence of the beautiful, the good, and the true. In this respect, philosophy has a lot to contribute to architecture. One thinks in particular of Kant, who never failed to warn against the divergent interest of reason depending on whether its end is taken to be knowledge, desire, or the issuing of aesthetic judgments. There was no need to await our contemporary era to learn that the convergence of the true, the good, and the beautiful is in no way natural. But on the other hand, shouldn't philosophy retain something for itself from architecture? The architectural mode of thinking is a project. As a philosopher thinks and produces concepts, the architect thinks and designs projects. Though this should no more prevent the architect from using concepts for their project than prevent the philosopher from establishing projects in thinking. On this second angle, what the 20th century gives rise to is the notion that every project has to articulate the three components of science, ethic, and aesthetics. If the philosophical experience alarms us against any naturally convergent project in its, ter in its turn, the architectural experience teaches us distrust of any non-constructivist project. It may be admitted that the beautiful, the true, and the good are not by themselves compatible, but that shouldn't prevent us from devising convergent solutions, no matter how temporary, provisional, or even local and accidental they may be. We have learned to distrust philosophical projects which pass over one or two of these components in silence, which, for instance, promote the true at the expense of the beautiful and the good, the scientist project, or which promote the beautiful at the expense of the true and the good, a static project, or finally, which promote the good at the expense of the true and the beautiful, the political project. But on the other side, we are inspired the same distrust by architectural projects which reduce the beautiful and the good to a consequence of the true, the modernist project, or on the contrary, which make a mockery of any convergence between the beautiful on the one hand and the true and the good on the other hand, the postmodernist project. In this respect, the various attitudes towards ornamentation are symptomatic. Among the modernists, ornamentation is accused on several counts. First, the recourse to ornamentation is seen as a functional surplus which is damaging to utility. Worse still, as decoration would be nothing but caprice emanating from the free subjectivity of the artist, 
it would escape all rationality. And what is more, ornamentation is suspect because it leads one to suppose that the constructive truth could not be beautiful in itself. Finally, the peak of aberration would be reached when decoration comes to disguise and travesty the object in representing something other than what it is. Then, ornamentation is first, in the eyes of the modernist, the sign of a radical divergence between the, tr the beautiful and the true. But the divergence that ornamentation introduces between the true and the good is no less marked. Seen from this angle, decoration is first a spiritual supplement reserved for the rich, thus serving as an index of social inequality, utilities for the poor, decorated objects for the rich. Thus, the modernists are devoted to, the, to designing standard objects for everybody which are purely utilitarian without decoration at the same time that they affirm that these objects are beautiful precisely because they are purely utilitarian. Furthermore, decorative luxury appears as a non-productive waste, a squandering of resources. Adolf Loos goes even further in declaring that since the low use of value, the, the low use value of decoration does not allow the worker to sell his labor at its real value, ornamentation would be a source of exploitation. So, modernist and postmodernist seems to be seem to be committing opposite mistakes. While the former subordinate the beautiful and the good to the true, the latter disregard the true and the good in focusing primarily on the beautiful. A few Greek pediments will soon liven up the concrete stru structure of social housing blocks. The functions of ornamentation becomes to obliterate both technical and social truth. You may be an, an African, unemployed in some Parisian suburb, but you still live in a Doric temple. Isn't that nice? Decoration as a new opium of the people. Of course, nothing is so simple. Although it's not rare that postmodernity reaches this zero degree of thought, and everything is in, in our multimedia era favors a spectacular architecture and this Hollywoodian cliché on the walls of our cities. But nevertheless, one should pay attention to the arguments of both sides, for ornamentation is a delicate matter which allows us to send back to back both the modernist and the postmodernist. So, let us begin by noting that the modernist used to present a very idealized version of constructive truth. Even if one sticks to the tectonic paradigm, the constructive rhetoric of the modern remains often very weak. The fact that the building has to stand upright, that it consequently, consequently must correctly conduct the downward pressure exerted by its weight on the material with which it is constructed is certainly an important aspect of construction. However, even if we limit ourselves to this static conception of truth, it should immediately be recalled that many other forces have to be taken into account as well. For instance, a workshop with a light metal frame only covered with corrugated iron will no doubt easily remain upright, but it will have to be anchored to prevent it from being lifted and blown away by strong winds. Thus, the dematerialization of the supporting elements and the Gothic opposition to weight no longer necessarily rule the distribution of force in a building. Sticking to this old model of downward pressure is evidence of an anthropomorphism which very few modernists have been able to shake off. 
the fact of having to take account of lateral and even upward forces generated by gusts of wind is doubly significant. Not only is it no longer a question of counteracting weight, but the struggle is not even against stable, permanent, and regular forces at all. A building is naturally oversized because it is subject to the stochastic forces of nature. A workshop is anchored because now and then we can expect the wind to play us tricks with a frequency which very much depends on the local conditions. Hence, the calculation of the engineers, the reduction of the section of the girders to a minimum, is subordinated to the definition of a statistical framework which fixes the standards of acceptable risks for each type of construction. Architecture is thus, by definition, a frame of probability in its function, its form, and its construction. We seem to have lost the question of ornament, but have we? After all, what can the notion of a decorative surplus mean if a building is by nature oversized and calculated to withstand exceptional forces which no longer have any connection with the traditional diagram of reaction to weight? There is no such thing as an optimized structure on a, on a stable ground in relation to which decoration could appear as a supplement. Fortunately enough, because technical truth doesn't end with statics. The truth of the material is usually an ideal notion divorces, divorced from the ravages of time and weather. Structure must be clad. From this point of view, ornamentation often bears witness to a much more developed constructive sense than the purest element presented in their structural truth. Emphasized window frames, cornices, and a host of other decorative elements can be seen to take part in a system of water management and protection which assures traditional buildings a longevity which is the envy of many modern works. It is as if, through its use of ornamentation, the constructive tradition displayed more rationality than the rationalists themselves. In fact, the very charge that laws levels against ornamentation is based on the assumption that there is no longer any agreement possible, that ornamentation is no longer linked organically to our culture. The ornament is no more connected with anything human. It is in no way connected to the order of the world. That's sentences from laws. Initially, it is for the same reasons that Luce accepted the ornamentation of the primitive and antique peoples who had a genuine decorative culture, while categorically rejecting the survival of ornamentation on modern utilities. Luce, therefore, replies in advance to the postmodernists who invoke the necessity of tradition and histor historicity for all decorative elements in architecture. Of course, it is necessary to refer to a tradition, but to one which is still alive. Does the antique tradition still have an organical relation with the world of today in a different manner than the generalized regime of the cliché? To this question, Adolf Loh's reply is category negative, but his argument moves rapidly to a second level of response. In our modern culture, the beautiful would have to be radically separated from the useful. On the one hand, it is good for loss. It is good that utilities are true, but on the other hand, we should leave the beautiful out of all this in the pure world of art. Let the house be useful, good because true. As for architecture, with a capital A, Art only concerns the monument. Laws considers 
that no consensus can be reached anymore because of the divorce between the naturally convergent good and true on the one hand and the beautiful on the other, whose achievement is only assured to the extent that it is free from the two other forms of value. In this respect, Law's position also prefigures the, su the supposedly as aristocratic opinion of some of our contemporaries who are urgently clamoring for a return to a clear-cut separation between culture with a capital C and the others despised forms of cultures. In opposition to arguments like those advanced by Zemper, Voringer, and Riegel, we are now witnessing the, the reappearance of this obsolete distinction between major and minor arts, between painting and decoration as if all frescoes were inferior to paintings or all moldings inferior to sculptures. Meanwhile, this doesn't prevent Lowe's from making a remark which seems to offer us a brief glimpse of a way out. If the artist works for the eternity, the ornamentalist may put himself at the service of industry and produce fashionable effects in which the only function of ornamentation is to make our objects always more ephemeral. Will this make consumers buy more? That's what the industry wants. Gloss didn't fully appreciate this, accelera this acceleration in the rate of rotation of capital funds, but he did at least indicate a possible way of linking ornamentation to our capitalist mode of production. Is it enough? Is fashion the only way of looking at decoration nowadays? And if so, how can ornamentation be given back the past and future whose absence Lowe's criticized? The question is all the more difficult now that, after the critical examination of the modernist project, we have seriously called into question the idea of technical truth in architecture. And since the aesthetics and the ethical values of the modernist derived from this very technical truth, the whole system collapses. How can the beautiful, the good, and the true converge when the first two principles can no longer be regarded as a consequence of the third? On the other hand, should one join the postmodernists in following the good by disguising the true with the beautiful? Is it enough to keep on sticking increasingly ephem ephemeral cliché onto the structures which have been conceived to bring about an accelerated amortization of fixed sets? Does the historical tradition merely lead us back to Greek drapery? Are there no other avenues out of the absolute convergence of the modernist values and the radical di divergence of the postmodernist values. In reference to our formal approach in terms of inflection, vector, and frame, let's say that we will focus on ornaments of the jewelry's type, or let's say the vegetal rinso, since the modernists have never given up an emphasis on frames and vectors. In wishing to present structures and forces in their naked truth, the modernists soon moved on to their staging. And as everyone knows, rhetoric is always already decoration, even when it comes to the litot of less is more. No, the heart of the question of ornament, the object of the crime is a floral drollery, not the spire surmounting the tower, nor the molding encasing the window, but the vegetal frieze. The charge that these ornaments come to overload, or even worse, disguise the architecture with artificial vegetation, is what no mitigating circumstances can justify in the eyes of the modernists. However, can we be sure that the vegetal ornament is nothing but a hateful caprice? Are we confronted with a doubled assault on necessity and truth, arbitrary, arbitrary backed up by lie? 
is it not necessary to search for an ornamental truth instead? That is what Alois Regald proposed right from the first page of Stillfragen. To make the vegetal ornament an object of science is to send back to back both the prosecution and the defense. In opposition to the modernist who had taken the Callimachus fable of Vitruvius literally, Regal sets out to demonstrate that the vegetal ornament <laughs> is not representative. The acanthus leaf is not the rough imitation of a weed, but the result of a transformation of the Egyptian motif of the palmet as a result of its transposition into a relief sculpture. As Regal puts it, if one examines the oldest ornamental acanthus leaves, one note that they omit precisely the particular characteristics of the vegetal species. Then, in opposition to the modernists, Regal sets out to demonstrate that vegetal ornamentation obeys a grammar which has been constituted in the course of history with precise and consistent rules. Sure, fundamental motives remain throughout, throughout history, but its permanence is in no way in an arbitrary citation of symbolic or traditional motives. On the contrary, the lotus flower will be the object of a perpetual re-elaboration in history. What is at stake? Regal evokes two series of transformation. The first series is purely geometrical and is taken to characterize the abstract art of so-called primitive peoples such as the Maori from New Zealand. In this series, the circle gradually turned into a spiral, which has doubled itself into a second inverted figure in order to form sequences capable of covering surfaces. In fact, primitive art is taken to respond to a sort of horror vacui. Decoration is then intended to assure the feeling of the surfaces. The second series of transformation originates in Egypt, where Regal locates the first appearance of ornamental vegetal motifs. From that time on, the lotus flower and the related palmet will remain constant in all of the latter developments. All the same, this persistence does not prevent these elements from undergoing transformation. The petal may fan out in volutes with drops inserted in the corners of these volutes. Or the flowers may be linked to, to one another by the spiral elements, which can in turn be accompanied by tresses, as in Mesopotamian art. And precisely, brick ornamentation appears at the point of intersection of these two series of transformation. Uh, I, I advise you to go to the bookshop. They now have uh, the book of Regal. And you, you will see all that in more detail. Uh, but uh, Mycenaean art uh, retains the element derived from the lotus flower, but the link between them becomes independent. This is the origin of the supple, lively, and rhythmical vegetal rinsel. As Regal puts it, from now on, the constitution of Rinso ornamentation has always occupied pride of place in the latter development of ornamental art. So, let us return to this starting point. The undulating Rinso appears in Mycenaean art under two forms, a continuous and an intermittent form. To describe the intermittent form, Regal uses in passing the notions of inferior and superior extrema, but his knowledge of the mathematics of singularities unfortunately seems to stop at this point. And it's a pity, because the intermittent figures are nothing but a succession of inflections, while the principal branch of the continuous form is explicitly presented as a periodical function of a sinusoidal type. Now, if the vegetal rinso is a connecting thread linking, linking all the forms of ornamentation 
which emerge in the Greco-Egyptian antiquity. And if, in principle, the rinso is an inflection, we can try to understand ornamentation in a new way. The very essence of vegetal ornamentation would be to introduce the inflections of varying curvature within the frame of architecture. In this sense, ornamentation replicates the interior replicates in the interior the relation of architecture to the terrain. Ornamentation is not just there to liven up buildings, but to pursue the endless dialogue between the frame of architecture and the inflection of the free curvature of surface. Architecture imposes its structure of probability on the terrain. Architecture delimits the the precincts of the, of the probable within which the vectorial incidents occur on the inflection of the possible. And we have seen that construction itself incorporates a margin of probability which includes random occurrences. We may thus ask ourselves whether ornamentation could not be seen in a different way as that which renders visible the margins of fluctuations which every architecture has to handle, just as Paul Klee assigned to, to painting the aim of making visible invisible forces. The role of the beautiful today would therefore be to give form to a new value of truth between the three registers of the possible, the probable, and the actual. We are no longer situated in the old relation of the true to the false, in which ornament could serve to disguise a pre-established truth. On the contrary, we live in an epoch where we all experiment that truth is always a matter of, of construction, always depending on empty frames which only imperfectly enclose the actual to separate it from the virtual. Indeed, Platonism stands on its head when the model is no longer subject to imitation but to simulation. We quit the opposition between the true and the false while truth becomes a matter of actualization on a virtual surface. And if truth is no longer defined in terms of the relation of the true to the false but of the actual to the virtual, when the true is no longer anything but one of the possible actualization of the virtual, the territory comes back to its state of loose earth, free curvature, <coughs> pure singularity persisting under the identities that architecture will frame. But the ornament itself becomes a virtual surface. The vegetable rinso undergoes the same trans transposition into relief as the antique palmet while it became an acanthus leaf. The inflections of the rinso unfold in 3D space. The frieze becomes a subjectile. The frames of architecture remain what they are. No frieze comes to disguise them. Simply, a free curvature subjectile comes to render visible the margin of fluctuations which always persists radical discrepancy of architecture toward every function, no less radical oversized dimensions of the construction, reserve of virtuality on the most framed territory. The beautiful, the beautiful becomes the mark of a distance from the true intended as identity, arbitrariness of the actual. But on the other way round, the beautiful gives shape to the singular as a reserve of the virtual, which will never actualize. The subjectile is therefore inscribed in the tradition of the vegetal rinso, of which it is only a transposition in relief, just as the acanthusive was a 3D transposition of the palmette. It is no less the expression of our contemporary culture where an undulation cannot be seen anymore as a succession of submits and valleys because we know 
there is no stable ground on which we could weigh down and arise. In this state of weightlessness, we cannot assign minima and maxima, but focus on the singular, interestingly, the inflection. It is also a political project. Means of production have changed. Industry in the digital age can now also focus on the singular. More precisely, we are afraid that the logic of standard production will lead to ever more massive unemployment in Europe and either ever worse wages in the States because of the always increasing productivity gains generated by digital technologies. Non-standard production or mass customization might then, on the contrary, appear as one way of creating ever richer products leaving calculable tasks to computers and machines. Meanwhile, human beings would focus on ever more actions requiring judgment. And we think architecture is a good sector to start with non-standard production because the building industry has always resisted real standardization. For the bankruptcy of modernity, it is said, would be based on the absurdity of the tales of emancipation in the light of the two major events of this century, the final solution and the gulag. The symmetry of these events is impressed upon us, a symmetry by virtue of which no project would be possible any longer, whether left or right trap in which we could only stick to the gray re-engineering of the real politic. So, these two events would be symmetrical, Auschwitz and Siberia, but in relation to what? What needs to be constantly reminded of is the background of these events, the violence of the first age of industrialization. Just think that the only public service worth to be considered in England around 1850 was the reform of internment. No matter how harsh the working and living conditions of the people, let them be buried properly. An immense burial ground of 600 acres above the round chapel in which 100 bodies should be consecrated daily in three sections, therefore, 30 to 35 sim simultaneously. In order to avoid the worry and painful impression by the rapid performance of successive separate services, it will generally be necessary to have several bodies, but by architectural arrangements, each party of mourners may be kept private and separate from the others. Their place in the church will be a sort of stall capable of holding 12 persons. Gottfried Zemper had proposed 18. Doesn't that smell something? Unfortunately, the cholera epidemic, which spread out in October uh, 1848, lasted only 15 months, and at its height, there were only 345 deaths a day in London alone. When the epidemic stopped, Zemper, freshly escaped from Germany, probably a precursor, couldn't believe that with the, with the danger past, the project would soon be abandoned. We think that Adolf Loos put the question of ornament correctly in refusing to disconnect it from the question of work. And he was also right to refuse a craftsman's ornament whose exchange value diminished with the development of industrialization. But industry is changing. Variable curvature has, begun, has become the object of automated processes. Can it not become the sign of the only project left to us, the emancipation of work, by making it richer and shorter? The voice of, in the film Night and Fog, from Alain René, 
was astonished that herbs could continue to grow on the ground of the camps as if nothing had happened. So what might be the value of our vegetal ornaments in the early mornings of our suburban trains? Signs, just signs, that some good is still possible without dismissal of the true and the beautiful, that there remain margins within the structure of the capital, that loose divergent threads can locally be not. Thank you. I'm glad that it worry uh, people. But uh, uh, if you have you heard of uh, Nicolas Tarabukin, uh, the last painting, uh, and uh, there is a famous uh, constructivist statement: uh, "Du chevalet à la machine." Uh, chevalet. I don't know how to say it. Uh, the chevalet is the old device on which painter. Uh, yes. So, so uh, it's very strange to, to read Zemper and learn that uh, at the beginning uh, the painting uh, was in fact a wall painting, what we would call now decoration. A and that in fact uh, to do this painting uh, they, they had to, to ca they, they would start on a wooden panel or uh, even a metal structure, which was so heavy uh, that it couldn't uh, be carried by human beings. So they had to use a machine to put this painting, to, to hold this painting and put it on the wall. Uh, so uh, painting started as a machine and not an easel. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, uh, we want to put on the same level uh, what is called the fine arts and uh, the decorative arts. And we think that we have now to come back to decorative arts in order to start a new direction in architecture because everything has changed in the environment. So th that's just one aspect of, of your question. Uh, so that's the reason why we call ourselves uh, constructivists because of uh, this uh, Zemper inversion of uh, the Soviet uh, 
idea of, uh, of art, of the evolution of art. Uh, as, uh, another topic which is always asked to us is uh, the question of how we choose. Um, and uh, I answer pure subjectivity. So you have to enrich your subjectivity uh, to get the, the best choice. Uh, so for instance, uh, training in architecture school should enrich your subjectivity in order to choose. Uh, well, we, we are working all day long with computers, but we are not uh, cyber artists. Uh, we still believe that we have to learn a lot from the past, uh, especially because in fact uh, the, the modernists <coughs> And even I would say, uh, well, mainly the modernists uh, have uh, a very weak idea of geometry and shape. And now geometry and shape is no more taught in architecture school. Maybe here, but uh, usually uh, architects are very weak at, at shapes. And uh, if only we would be able to draw uh, Muslim ornamentation, uh, we would know much more about geometry than we do. Uh, an another example, for instance, even in uh, uh, history of art, I'm presently uh, reading with color uh, about the Baroque architecture. And it's, it is very strange that about the volute and all the curved elements of the, of the Baroque, he doesn't say a word about uh, uh, a word uh, other than just undulating structure, but he's not able to go deep into uh, the geometric transformation of the Baroque architecture into Rococo because he has no knowledge of geometry. And for instance, uh, all the Guarini architecture uh, has to do with the conic uh, sections, which Vitkovas knows perfectly well, but his knowledge is too weak to go into it. Uh, so uh, we think that the computer is really the basic tool of today. But beside that, uh, the, the aesthetic judge judgment is made by you as an architect. And uh, it depends on, on your education. Yes. of the construction of the textile itself in <coughs> is not something that is purely a subjective decision. It actually is something that is also a form of uh, construction of, of imagination. So it's, it's, not, it's not so so divided. Huh? Oh, no, 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 no. But, but I mean, in, in the way that you present the kind of duality between modernism and postmodernism, you seem to present this kind of simplistic version of modernism on one level purpose of the argument where you're saying it's all to do with certain kinds of utilitarianism and so because it's utilitarian it's true and hence it's beautiful whereas one could say that in fact the history of modernism has been constantly intertwined with this question problematics of one another where someone like Mies is very much concerned with certain aspects of the comparison surface returning to the African and returning to the whole question of the skin which I think becomes very interesting when you say that there is in fact another version of which is nevertheless not the idea of the decorated shed, which is the idea of how could you, so like going back to your example of the frame or the windowsill or whatever, actually reinvent these conditions in a way that is to do with an architectural design, which has a dimension of supplementarity, but it is not something which would be a simple replication of the traditional idea of the frame. At that point, you're actually constructing it is also ornamentation, but it doesn't look like, for example, the traditional window frame. And I am very much interested in then that version of constructive uh, building or constructive imagination, which is not open to pure subjectivity. It is not to do with whether I like it or I don't like it. It's a 
that one of the problems that I think you're setting up, for example, with your people, is that you open yourself up to certain inversions, for example, of organicism, or naturalism, uh, or return to a kind of rock and roll, which is also a decision, it's also a choice. And I would say that this is actually a problem, because now you're somehow distancing yourself from alternative forms of construction, which are not natural. And why? Why, for example, why do that in terms of the table as, as an example of that? Because it's so close to certain forms of naturalism and away from certain ideas of more constructive or constructive forms of imagination, uh, which would be different from the, from the natural naturalism. Why, yeah. should, why should fundamental, why should ornament be always tied to this condition of naturalism? Should always be? Tied to naturalism. Uh, I, I wouldn't call what you are doing naturalism. Well, well, you see, I mean, the thing that you use the example of calligraphy. I, I, I happen to be Iranian, so we, I write in terms of the, the calligraphy. I wouldn't say that it's only to do with its ornamental stuff. It's part of that, but it also makes a kind of landscape yes. in the way that you write. So it isn't a simple thing of turning, taking that those words putting them on a three-dimensional surface, surface, and then you have with something that's three-dimensionally, but it's actually understanding the nuances of what happens when you have a center line and a center line, where you make the turn, and where you put the dot, and all of these are part of this surface topography, which again is not a subjective thing. It's actually something that holds. It's something that you read it, we share that, that somebody writes very badly, or they write very well. Well, there are many topics in your question so uh, uh, no 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 I, I will try to 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 uh, at least m make clear that uh, of course uh, uh, the the presentation of the modernist and the modernist uh, I've done is a clear-cut separation uh, for rhetorical purposes uh, Mark Wigley uh, in whiteness de demonstrated very well the fact that uh, on a modernist uh, used the white as a cladding, for instance, uh, and not uh, present and did not present the structure in the, its naked truth. So that's for sure. Uh, but uh, what became uh, the modernist uh, school of way of thinking? is in fact, uh, I think, as clear-cut as I presented it itself. Uh, itself. Now, wh what we are trying to do is to find a middle path between those two uh, way of thinking. Uh, one way is, uh, uh, and I think that uh, Zemper uh, always tried to do that, uh, because Zemper is, all, is uh, very much criticized to be a materialist by Rigo. And in the meantime, the modernists rejected him uh, as being an architect of the past and not going e uh, further in, uh, far enough into the direction of modernity. Uh, so uh, our discourse is uh, not ambiguous in, uh, in the sense of fuzzy but it is uh, in the sense of a knot. It means that we intertangle, uh, we intertangle uh, different <coughs> threads and try to tie them locally, although those threads remain independent and loose. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, this discourse is not an, an easy one. I don't know if it's...
Well, I, I think that for the Greek, uh, Greek, uh, the Akentus leaf had a meaning that they could understand uh, directly. Uh, so if we come back to a new kind of ornamentation, uh, this must be linked to our contemporary experiences. And I think that our contemporary experiences deal more, more and more with digital waves and uh, computers and things like that. And I think that for people uh, living in a digital age, all these uh, curved surfaces are part of our aesthetic experience and uh, also mean something, uh, for instance, uh, the curves of the variation of uh, the stock markets, for instance. Uh, all these uh, curved surfaces have a meaning for us. And uh, I think that uh, if we keep on drawing undulating ornamentation, it's no more in the same, uh, for the same content than the Greek, but because of contemporary contents. Yes, sure, but uh, uh, it surprised me. If, if you look at what happened into graphic design and interior design uh, the ten, 10 years ago, uh, you wouldn't see hardly any curved line. And if you look at it right now, uh, everywhere you, you see undulating lines. And this is not the mark of a good design, it's just uh, part of our contemporary uh, attitude. I think that uh, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, uh, everybody sees that as a digital uh, wave or as a fluctuation on the stock market, but uh, I just noticed that uh, uh, you, you take any kind of designer now, they will always trace uh, an undulating line, so there must be something in the air. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, 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 yeah,